Hello and welcome to the very first episode of VUCA Insights Podcast. And today, we have someone from Down Under. And um, it's he's a mate, as I would like to uh, call him. And uh, he had a very interesting journey into investing. Uh, I wouldn't introduce too much until we go into the store itself, but um, we met through mutual friends and he is doing financial content creation on kind of like a full-time basis, which is a lot of what I respect people who do it. So welcome to the show, Kalani. Oh, John, thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah, very kind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Kalani, I mean, um, Tell me a little bit about a 15-year-old Kalani. How, how was he like? I mean, was it a very carefree childhood or was it something that was under a lot of strenuous pressure like Asian parents to kids, you know? <laughs> Definitely not strenuous. Nah, I was a bit of a rat bag as a kid. I wasn't the best child. Um, so, yeah, like growing up, I, I'm just obsessed with sports. I always wanted to be a sportsman, play AFL, which is Australian football, or go down that path. Um, academia, education wasn't really on my radar. And I wanted to be a sparky, so electrician yeah. in Australia. So especially being in WA, it's very mining based and it's very much in our wheelhouse. So that was sort of my plan, my backup plan if I didn't play AFL. So if you fast forward a few years, still being a little rat bag, a bit of a troublemaker, I sort of started working as a TA, which is like a trade assistant. And I was like, mm -hmm. nah, I'm not, I'm not doing hard labor for the rest of my life. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think for, for the, a little bit of nuance, since most of us uh, may not know this term sparky, perhaps elaborate how did this name even come about for the for the electrical trade, you know? Any history, background? I don't even know. I suppose yeah. you stuff up to create sparks. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because <laughs> like, I think in mm -hmm, America, is, spark, is a sparky someone that works with like in film and TV? Like, I think. Okay. Mm, interesting. I, I probably have to go Google deeper to, to try to find out. Like, you know, in Australia, say Bob's your uncle it means everything's fine, right? It's, it's exactly. like a nuance. It's, it's like a nuance thing. And yeah. I, I had I had the pleasure of knowing a, a great Australian. He was my uh, he was my mentor when I was in in Holland. So he was like telling me things like this, and I'm like, Bob's your uncle. So Bob's everyone's uncle. Then everything's gonna be fine, right? <laughs> yeah, she'll be right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you pick it up. Yeah, just nod and say yeah, and you're yeah, yeah no, nah, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Yeah. So you did a trade assistant. Um, is, is the apprenticeship culture very strong in Australia? Is it something like uh, in Germany as well, where trade and craft is actually part and parcel of everyday life, especially in uh, Perth, where you grew up? I mean, close to Perth. Yeah, like especially Perth. So I, I live an hour south of Perth, just for context. So mm -hmm. it's not exactly upper class. Like it's, it's pretty working class, like a lot of mates. Um, like put it this way, I only had two mates from um, high school go to university that I know and study like accounting and finance. Like I didn't have, I didn't know the pathways available to me and stuff like that. So for me, being a Sparky, everyone knew the ins and outs, what's involved. And um, like, I don't know, compared to other countries, I talked about this with uh, Eugene and Chong Su Jing in Singapore and mm. like doing apprenticeships isn't looked down upon like at all. Like it's, mm. it's pretty like upper middle uh, I don't know what you'd call it, echelon of jobs, you know, like compared to going to university. Like, so, and it's good pay. Like we get paid pretty well being with mining and even just, even if you do commercial and residential um, sparky work, you're pretty well off mm. and you don't work too hard compared to like bricklaying, say, or I see. other trades. So, yeah. Okay. that Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you mentioned, you know, to we kind of like live in kind of a bubble. Kalani, you realize that it's like a lot of the people we admire, people we respect in, within the community, we all like kind of like have this mutual respect for each other. And then we, <laughs> interesting that you had this same chat with Eugene and Serging as well, right? Yeah. And the same things come up, but I know it's interesting because yeah, you, you just don't know until you, until you know. Correct. 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 Um, so what's like, uh, what's the finance culture like in Australia? Um, is it? I know I've I've not done the numbers. Uh, I I know most Asian countries are having a saving culture, but in Australia, is it more of a spender culture, consumer behavior, uh, consumer spending culture, or more of a saver, or is it a hybrid in between? I mean, let the audience. Um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely geared towards spending. Like mm. same thing, high incomes. 
It's like uh, ca cashed up bogans. It's called Cubs. Like Ooh, someone oh, who works on the mines. It. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cashed up bogans. So it's okay. like a cashed up redneck. So they like they work on the mines. They come home. They buy jet skis. They buy big utes. And um, and even Australians, it's very much. I hate it, but it's very much as part of it. It's like gambling culture. Like people mm. are willing to have a punt. Um, like and even if you lose, it's a good story to tell your mates. You know what I mean? Like so, wow. <laughs> oh, I've got gambling stories. Not just me, but even mates that just like thousands of dollars and even uh i won't name my mates but there was a couple guys that thought they bought into a horse and put a few grand in and lost it and it never like it's just yeah it's everywhere you can't escape it so yeah definitely okay. spender definitely spending okay okay that's interesting because i i know there's a huge i mean Mal malaysian companies honky companies they have huge casinos in in australia and you know, uh, it was quite riled up. It was kind of like a crisis, right? There was a point of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even like just culture. Lucky in, in Western Australia, we don't have um, like po pokey machines. We call them pokies. Uh, I don't know what the actual term is. Slot machines, yeah. right? Slot machines. Yes, correct. Um, so in the Eastern States, I think it's a lot more pervasive in terms of if you go down to the local pub, there's pokey machines. Whereas in WA, it's only at the casino, so it's not as bad. But mm -hmm. with mobile betting now, it's everywhere. You can't oh. escape it. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought the legislation would have been tougher, but I guess it's tax revenue over everything else, right? <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> Greyhounds, horses, pokey machines, like they generate so much money. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Great. Um, if you were to think back on your teenage years or even maybe your university years, uh, uh, how many out of a percentage maybe um let's say out of the 10 friends that uh you were you went to uni together with and you did accountancy right in in uni how many of them actually talk about investing about business about you know it doesn't need to be precise maybe just give yeah. me a ballpark right from people that studied at uni with it may maybe like 20 percent, 30 percent, if i'm lucky yeah. Yeah. and wow. then with my local friend group it was like literally nothing until maybe COVID hit and then there was nothing to do and then people started ah. getting into it. But um, nah, I, I was lucky because my old man always tried to get me in investing and talk to me about it. I didn't want to hear any of it. I just ignored him. <laughs> but then as soon as I turned 18, I don't know, it was like a light switch. I was like, oh, I can just like put money away and it's better than savings and you can buy companies. And it kind of sounded cool to me. So ah. but yeah, the culture isn't there, but it's getting better. A lot of mates, maybe it's just as we get older, they get more interested and yeah. What do you think is the pivot when they get older? Is it because they started a family or is it because um, most of them, is it? Yeah, so I'm getting that age. Some of my mates having kids and stuff. Um, housing, I think, is still the major like asset class. Everyone knows like housing always goes up and it's tangible. It's easy to see. You know, you buy a house and you might rent it out or it might appreciate. It's so easy to understand. But I don't know. During, yeah, start of COVID, I think a lot more people got interested in investing and maybe with the greater news around GameStop and stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's getting better, but it's good. Like I've got a few mates who just invest in index funds and have sort of gone down that track. So it's good to see um, at least more people aware of it, but it's still growing. Okay, okay, okay. What 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 do you think is the the bottleneck or what's stopping them from going into the markets? You know, I mean, yeah. have you sat, sat back and reflect, or they, did they give you feedback? No, good question. Because I was literally, I was like, oh, I should have added to that, but um. Even just being able to access markets. So when I started investing at 18, what was that? 2014, maybe, or something? Okay. Being able to access like ETFs, index funds was not that easy with Vanguard and stuff. Ah. And it was a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. So the price is probably like halved or even one third of what they used to be. And even now you can, um, I don't know if you guys have BPay, but it's like every two weeks, it will automatically come out of your bank account and can invest in index funds now. Whereas like those things just weren't around when I was 18. So in the span of, yeah, eight years. It's it's come a long way and it's a lot easier. And even investment education. Like there's one guy in Australia, um, Scott Pape, like the barefoot investor. Okay. He's oh, yes, like Yeah, he's like the guru, I guess. I don't know who the American equivalent is, like Dave Ramsey, maybe mm -hmm. be the like so he's our Australian Dave Ramsey. So he's got a lot more people who like talks in a real Australian down to earth tone. Mm. People one can get with it. So yeah, it's a bit of education, bit of access. Yeah. Okay, great. And I, I, it's it's heartening to hear because I think I see the same here in Malaysia. More and more young people. I mean, when I started investing 2008, 2009, the only resources we had was either books. Uh, blogs was just a new thing. Mm, <laughs> right? Yeah. It was a new thing. 
uh, YouTube just started, you know, 2007, 2008, there was n literally not much financial content out there. And, and today, you are, you, are, you are actually filled, I think you're swamped with so yeah. much uh, financial information, right? <laughs> There's yeah. so much out there, but it's getting better. Um, yeah, I don't know. And you guys have no capital gains taxes, which is unreal. So yeah, this is exactly, you know, and, and this is what I try to tell a lot of people in Malaysia. I think the best asset class to invest in in Malaysia is really just equities, man. I mean, like, even withholding tax for uh, REITs, uh, dividend yields is only 10%. So it's, yeah. it's, it's insane, you know, it's like, <laughs> but yeah. Again, I think we, we, as we move towards the uh, progress in the conversation, uh, we, we're going to talk about manipulated markets and all that. And I think that's a perception that I don't know whether it's prevalent in Australia as well, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of mining stocks, a lot of small caps, right? And, and <laughs> I would love to hear your side of the story about how the Australians perceive the market as whether it's manipulated or not, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. well, it's definitely an extension of the gambling culture, but yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. So when was your first touch to investing in finance? And you did allude to your dad. What, what was your dad's background? Was he was he a businessman? Was he in, into finance? Yeah, so um, the old man's an accountant by trade. And I think he's like a low CFO. Like he's definitely not, we definitely weren't um, rolling in money, but okay. he always tried to get me just into the idea of investing. Like he would encourage me to save and invest in some shares. And it was like not much, but I never really, care just i don't know you're a kid you think you're smart and know it all mm. and you're, anything your parents do is so uncool so i kind of ignored it but he was um like heavily into or trying to get me into it but i just never wanted a bar of it i just thought like, don't care but i don't know why 18 i think because i had a job there was a bit of savings and it's like a switch just flicked and i was like oh my god and then i just went on like a consumption binge of books and whatever <laughs> i could but um yeah no the old man definitely tried to get me into it but other than that it's never talked about like i was lucky because i don't think many other kids parents would talk about it so mm -hmm. yeah yeah well, what was the first book since you mentioned it um so i remember it was rich dad poor dad but then i read that and i was like okay the ideas are great but what specifically do i do i was like this this is so good but so useless at the same time <laughs> um and then i think i don't know if it was definitely the next book because i'm sorry i'm just looking at my bookshelf here yeah but the biggest one that probably influenced me the most was peter lynch's one up on wall street because mm. it was it's like practical. It's like you look for products you see and use and enjoy and then look at their shares and yeah, a bit of financial analysis. And I I would have started my accounting degree when I was 18. So mm -hmm. at that stage, I at least I had some very, very basic like financial statement analysis. Of, like, you know what I mean? I could read that. So yeah, um, Paul, uh, no, Roger Montgomery, sorry, is like an Australian guy that puts out a bit of writing and has a good book. Um, yeah, I don't know. What about you? I'm trying to think. No, no, Peter Lynch was my favorite because yeah. I tried to read Intelligent Investor. It just <laughs> yeah. securities analysis. I look at the table of content. Pretty much. <laughs> but <clears throat> I guess I, I guess both of us share that same favorite one on Lynch is because it's written in such a way it's laymanish, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if you like you understand the nuance behind it that's where that's yeah and you know in in your interview of me uh when i was on your podcast i we mentioned about we talked about rereading a book mm. and <clears throat> i realized that when i read it earlier much earlier on in my in my investing career so so to speak what i got from it and what i got from it today is going to be very very different yeah exactly um, yeah I, I need to do more revisiting books but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't read the whole book in entirety. Maybe there's certain chapters that I remember, like what I recall very vividly about Lynch's book, uh, uh, One Up on Wall Street, was how he could buy. I don't know whether it's One Up or Beating the Street, but there was a case study where he talked about uh, the privatization of government companies. So, British Telecom. And then the second one that really struck me was really um, him buying Volvo. Uh, for exact, uh, the entire market cap was uh, exactly the cash they had. So yeah. you got the whole business for free, right? So that really blew my mind away. I was like, right, yeah. Yeah, and then it's just finding opportunities. Like, So there was that. And then also, I don't know, I think I learned a lot getting burned investing. Thank God when I first started investing, they weren't all home runs from the start because then I mm -hmm. probably would have had a bit of, I don't know, God, God, what's it called? God complex or whatever. You know what I mean? I think I'm so good. So like, I think my first three investments all sucked. So at least I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I have something to learn here. And I'm not as good as I think I am. 
<laughs> no, it's 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 always good to start when you're down because, mm -hmm. like what you said, if you've if you've gotten uh, success early on, you don't sit back and reflect what went wrong, right? You you never, I mean, what were the steps necessary? Why why did you make a mistake and all that kind of thing? Uh, precisely, yeah, exactly. is, is spot on, right? Um, you finished your accounting degree and you went for to work for something like a, called a hedge fund. So tell tell us tell us a bit more hedge, more quant, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Tell, tell us a bit about that that path and what was it like, you know, working in this uh, this quant or hedge fund? Yeah, so there was a small blip before that. So I finished my accounting degree, but again, because I didn't know anyone that like was in that field, that scene, I didn't realize you had to sort of get internships um, before you finish your degree and put your name out there. And even my grades, like to be honest, they sucked. They were <laughs> terrible. So I finished my accounting degree. I was like, oh no, like no one's responding. What do I do? So I rolled into a master's of finance, which was easy mm -hmm. enough through my same university. Mm -hmm. And then I applied just for an internship with this quant fund, a local mm -hmm. quant fund. Um, and it was so good, literally second person there, greatest guy ever. So nice. So I literally got to learn everything from the ground up. And mm -hmm. by the end of my time, it was only a short amount of time because like shit hit the fan, things got wound up, not just due to our fault, but just due to the trustees. So, but for the short time there, by the end of it, I got to do yeah everything. So mm -hmm. you, it was a good... And it was, and that the biggest learning I took away was before that period, I was very hardcore value investor. Um, like value investing is the only way everyone else is wrong. Like there's no other different way. Whereas that sort of opened me up as in like, there's so many different ways to skin a cat, like find a way which works for you and which suits your personality. Um, but yeah, before that I was like, man, everyone who trades quantitatively or however they want to do is wrong. And yeah, so that was a big eye opener for me. Great. Did did you know about uh, the Jim Simons or the Two Sigma back then when you were in Quant? No, that was when I first started reading it. So I, then I listened to the audio book, The Man Who Solved the Market. Uh, yes. Jim, that was a very good book. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a big, big mind oh, shift. I see. <laughs> I mean, I just found out about Quant just, you know, probably four or five years ago. And it was like, mm -hmm. like I was like you, hardcore, value investing or nothing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the and it's other, fair enough. Because yeah. they sell it. They sell it so well. Like. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Actually, there's there's uh, there's a guy who is like, you know, he's a true blue value investor, but at the same time, he applies a lot. Quan um, Matt, Matt McLean of uh, First Eagle. Um, yeah. His mentor is uh, Jean Marie Elevant. Okay. No, I'm pulling blanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the guy was the first winner of uh, Morningstar's Best Fund Manager Award for three years consecutively. He's a legend, actually. I didn't even know about him. Yeah. Until now I'm going to uh, do some digging. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very, very interesting guy. Still alive. Uh, Jean Marie, a French guy. And he had a very interesting because, yeah. Go. go yeah. I, I'm not going <laughs> to go, but it's, it's, it's Did interesting. Did he have a book or a podcast? So how'd you get onto him? Uh, it was through a podcast, I guess. I, I gotta, I gotta, but it's uh, First Eagle. Yes. And what was interesting is because he's a, Jean Marie is a true blue value investor. But when Matt took over, uh, he's, uh, he's South African, if I'm not mistaken, or Zimbabwean, one, okay. of, one of those nationalities. Yeah. But when he took over, he applied quant strategies to value investing. So it's a hybrid. It's kind of a hybrid. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that, 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 that piqued my interest in like, mm -hmm. Um, I, I went on searching on the they're very low profile. That's why you, they are not a brand name. I put it this way. Yeah. Yeah. But why it's interesting is because like what you said, like we, both of us came to the same conclusion that there are many, many ways to make money, but how does it suit you and your style and, you know, your personality and your strategy, right? Everyone, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like I right. think value investing is great, but for some people it just doesn't work. And like I had a mate at uni who I met there, he did prop trading and like he did all right, but it suited him because he was like plugged into markets 24 seven. Whereas for me, mm. I like being able to switch off and sleep at night. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Prop traders, some, some that do well, really do very well. Yeah. Exactly. So he was, yeah. I was like, man, if it works for you, go for it. But for yeah. me, I was like, no, thanks. Like, no. <laughs> so here's where I get confused a little bit in the timeline. So after that quant fund, was this the period where you actually worked for um, um, Patrick O'Shea or was it before or after that? After. So when would that have been? Like if I had my LinkedIn up, I could plug in the years, but maybe that was middle of 2019. And okay. then so December 2019, I literally started posting online on Twitter and stuff. And then maybe 
maybe by mid-2020, end of 2020, mm -hmm. I reached out to the head of operations at Join Colossus, I see. Um, Damien. And then that's when I sort of started working with Invest Like the Best and Patrick O'Shag and how that all came about. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And what was it like? So maybe uh, to the audience, um, what we're talking about is uh, actually Patrick, or I can never pronounce his name, uh, last name correctly, or Shaughnessy, uh, right? It's Irish, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, he runs a hedge fund plus a, a, a production company, I would say, uh, called mm. Colossus. And um, that's where Kalani cut his teeth into like podcast editing and all that. And um, how many episodes were you going through every week in a way? Um, so literally, so I was there from basically the start, I think, because when it first started, Patrick was doing his episodes in Best Like the Best. That was it. And there was like transcripts here and there. And then they sort of like, no, we're going to turn this into a full-blown legit thing. So that's mm. when it like the wheels really started turning. So there was Invest Like the Best and then Founders Field Guide and they were starting business breakdowns. So mm. there was usually, at that point, there was two or three episodes a week and we could all sign up for, I think there was maybe eight of us. And, but there was also the whole backlog. So I don't know how many episodes there were in the backlog, like 160 or something. My gosh. <laughs> so it was like hectic there for a while. So you were almost doing for a while there. I don't know, one episode per day, if you could. Um, so you're going to, so your role included like scrubbing through the whole thing. Yeah. So we would get the transcript like AI generated or whatever. So it's like kind of sucky, okay. listen through, fix it up, edit it up. And then we'd add in like graphics, um, related show notes, all the links, all the, yeah. It's like when you find a podcast description thing, um, mm -hmm. we'd do all that, I guess, most of it. Yeah. I, I think why I wanted to tease that out is that a lot of people don't understand the work that goes behind the scenes yeah. to actually create a full balloon production podcast. And like people like you and me, we're solopreneurs. And it's like this for someone like Colossus, they're virtually an army. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's like, that's one thing I wish more people knew about my work. So I literally, I do all the prep work myself. I interview the person, obviously I mm. edit the audio by myself and I do all the show notes transcripts. Whereas for someone like Patrick, I think, I don't know, obviously Patrick does his own research and stuff, but I think there's still like a one page PDF that gets given. He's got his own um, podcast audio editor that does everything for him. There's obviously all the, I forgot the term, but the people that work and do all the transcripts mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a head of operations that manages it all and oversees it. So it's just like, yeah, it's a yeah. big operation. He, I can't remember. Army. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think maybe he sends out microphones to his guests. I think from memory. So I, I can... wouldn't be surprised because I do the same. There, there are times yeah. when I'm like, I, I know this guy doesn't have a good mic and I'm like this. And the, the best part about it is that I have to get a mic that it's so easy. Uh, like it's like a plug and plug play. In. Yeah. yeah. So it, if you talk about XLR inputs or whatever, no, it's going to be a USB, just plug it in and you're, you're good to go, right? Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's something similar, I think. From, I remember hearing an anecdote about it sometime, but I can't find a concrete evidence. But um, And yeah. same thing, I think only like two thirds of episodes that he actually records interviews get posted. Because I oh, remember God. one time I got given an episode, he's like, hey, can you look this over? And I listened to it and I kind of just zoned out and I was like, I, I, if I zoned out, obviously it's not that good. And then, yeah, it yeah. never got posted. So I see. Yeah, I yeah. see. It's, and it's a mixture of a few things, right? Either it was off topic or either audio quality wasn't there or the chemistry wasn't there, right? Many factors, right? Yeah. And like, um, in the nicest way possible, some people just aren't good for interviews. Like I don't, to be fair, I don't think I'm good at being interviewed. Like people are, some people are so good at telling stories and creating this one big cohesive um, storyline and it really mm -hmm. engages viewers. Whereas some people, it's just tougher. Like, you know, it's, not everyone's going to be a good talker or make a good podcast episode. So understood, yeah. understood. I, I I really like Brian Chesky. I mean, I it just the, just the name popped up because he's he's a damn good storyteller. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, like people that tell stories rule the world or whatever that quote is. Yeah, you exactly. know what I mean. Like, yeah. get your point across is so damn valuable. Exactly, exactly. So now you're doing your accountancy degree, doing your masters, um, and you you kind of had a taste of interning at a fund. Why pivot into content creation rather than, you know, either going to audit or either going to an investment bank, sell side analyst? I mean, the world's your oyster then, right? I mean, most accountants, I mean, for the, for the love of God, I don't think anyone loves audit for the sense of audit. <laughs> I, I mean, accountants who tell me, they love, I, I think they may not be really entirely honest with me, but 
what made you pivot in a way? You could have been a sell side analyst, buy side analyst, or even a portfolio manager, but why content creation? Um, I remember being at the quanti quantitative job and I would always, like, obviously I was consuming as much content as I could. And I remember Farnham Street every week. I was like, man, this is so cool, like curation every week. Um, and it, I think, I don't know, I'd played around with a few blogs and stuff before, like very, not nothing related to finance. So mm. I always liked putting stuff out there and getting feedback and um, I don't know, it's just like an outlet. But I remember Farnham Street, I thought about doing it while I was working there, but I put it off. And same thing, being in Australia, playing football, it's um, like tall poppy syndrome or the nail that sticks out gets hammered. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to take a risk and be teased for it. So I was always a bit hesitant. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of 2019, I think I just had enough. I was a bit off my footy. I didn't really care what they thought anymore. So I was like, I'll just start producing my stuff and putting myself out there under my own name. So mm -hmm. that's sort of what spurned it on. And yeah, I don't know. I just went from there, I guess. I get, were, were you not concerned about <clears throat> financial monetization, um, you know, uh, less beaten path? There's no playbook, right? And then, yeah, w was it not on your mind or was it? Nah, nothing. Like at that stage, literally like not on the radar at all. Because I was so yeah. early on, I didn't know. I think... I remember my first goal was like, oh, I just want to get to like 2,000 Twitter followers so like I can post a tweet and people actually interact with it because I remember mm -hmm. at the time having 20 followers, no one, you're just posting to the void. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, because I think that well, mid-2019, lost the job and by December, still didn't have any work. So I was like, stuff it, I'm just going to start writing some stuff. And then I got lucky January 2020 where I got mm -hmm. my lifeguard job at like Super Cruisy Naval Base. So I, I had enough spare time and opportunities to be able to write and do stuff on the side. So it's been a good complement to what I want to do. So yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest learning curve in a way? Because content creation, uh, it's it's more of the artsy side, right? In a mm -hmm. way. But at the same time, the, the topics that we both talk about, businesses, entrepreneurship, investing, um, is a lot of it is backed by facts and figures. So how do you balance that artsy side and and the, the quant itself or you're more focused towards the, the stories uh, of it that's a good question and i think i'm still figuring out myself i'm still not sure how to best present it i think obviously stories is the best thing and i don't know i think because i think i first sort of like blew up when i first started like curating some stuff so patrick o'shaughnessy would post a and it's kind of how i got the job with invest like the best patrick o'shag would be like what's the best podcast you listen to this year and 200 people comment and no one did anything with it. So I just went through all the comments, curated, like compiled them and then categorized them. And then those sorts of things blew up. So I was like, maybe mm. I should save people time, give them a bit of value for money or value for time, I guess, and save them all the work. And people really vibed with that. And then I was thinking about this literally the other day. I think I got a bit ahead of myself and a bit arrogant thinking I was a better writer. So I sort of transitioned more to writing longer form pieces and trying YouTube videos. I still like, I just still enjoy and I still keep doing, but, I think at my core, I still should give people value for time mm. um, and save them. Yeah. And even my newsletter, I got pushed into by a good mate. Thank God he did. Um, and yeah, that was based around curation. And mm. like every week I'd send out the best links or whatever. So, yeah. I think I think you, you, you hit something very, very interesting about today. People are, there's no excuse for you not to get information. But because of that, uh, you're overwhelmed with information that you do not know. Either you don't have it in a systematically curated form mm -hmm. or uh, you get it in a curated form, but then behind that curated form, there's a nuance behind it. Like, for example, um, I, I subscribe to tons of newsletters. I don't even have time to read all of them. I mean, I, it's interesting, right? And, and it's like within our alley about investing. I think you look through, you only have time to read a headline and there's probably a five-pager or a six, at worst 16 or 20-pager, 20, 20 right? But then I realized if I've given this to another analyst, someone who's trained in the field, but he doesn't know the nuance of the industry, it's just going to fly off his head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And same right? thing, like you said, it might be a five-pager. So it's like, where's the important bit? Yeah, where's the important bit, right? And And I think why I wanted to bring this up is about curation today. I mean, people say Google is actually uh, in a business of search, but actually there aren't, they're in a business of curation, right? Mm. In your opinion, what makes a good curation? What makes a good 
you know, I mean, you've you've gotten you you obviously gotten feedback that your curation was good, but mm. from your perspective, what makes a good curation? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> And this is only my opinion, but some curation is definitely more lower effort than others. Like some people will literally just post the title and a link and it's like, okay, yes, but where's the important bit or where should I be looking? So for me, I sometimes like just even just a small quote with a bit of bold. It's like, it's not that hard or even just an explanation, skip to this part for this area. Mm -hmm. And even then, I genuinely think being able to Google and certain things and pull quotes is a superpower. Like knowing what to search for can mm. be so valuable. Like especially for investing, there are so many obscure links and research PDFs that's not overly hard, but it's like one small step that lots of people just don't know how to. Wow, you're so spot on. <laughs> you know, Googling, it's a skill. Yeah, legit. It's, it's like a skill, man. <laughs> Like, yeah, just knowing search terms like searching with apostrophes or like searching within site names and especially on Reddit, oh, not Reddit, sorry, Twitter for me, um, that's been super valuable. Being able to filter this exact term. It's like such simple things or making sure a tweet has over a certain amount of likes. So, yeah, it's yeah, not and hard. Even keywords. Like, yeah. you wouldn't know, okay, when you start searching and you read about industry, you wouldn't know those terms before researching. Then you find out like, for example, I've just uh, <laughs> I'm working on um, looking at Farm Fresh, mm -hmm. so I've like looked at them, but I've always looked at the milk production side. But this term keeps on coming out: biological assets. So right, and then then I discovered that you've got to understand IS, IAS standard forty one, which is like <laughs> that's that's a, its own beast. <laughs> yeah, it's a beast. So it's like then you start going, and then then you start using the right words, and when you start using the right words, that's where the valuable stuff start coming up, you know. Yeah, if you use the wrong words, Google has like a billion over archive sites, right? So how are you gonna get to the? Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. So many people just search one general term, and it's like, yeah. man, if you just specify a few different things. Yes. Um, I think that's why. So I did a post on Lee Lu, yeah. and like I don't know, I just went deep down rabbit holes, knowing what to search, finding old newspaper articles, and yeah, it like took off just because I think I knew what the right things to find. Mm. and just present it like it was pretty much the story of his life which i don't think yeah. was amazing but Good. i think being able to collate everything was maybe what people enjoyed i guess yeah the, his tenement square involvement and all that kind of thing right and yeah especially and the older stuff yeah like because yeah. there's, there's lots of stuff about his investing for his like learning more about tiananmen the earthquake that he survived um like his his parents like weren't there when he was early in life um same thing like his book. He had a book, but it was like 160 bucks. So I was like, stuff it, I'll pay for it. And I think it's been <laughs> valuable for me. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I, I think that's where I'm trying to tease out the, the value of content creators. It's not, it's, it's not like you need to be, what do you call it? Uh, you need to be revolutionary in what you discover. Sometimes it's really like helping people save time helping people get through the thick of things. There's maybe a thousand and one things, but you have said, hey, these are the 10 key points, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what people want, which is insights, you know? But people don't realize, they say, hey, but but Kalani, you know, you just 10 points, right? You, you didn't create the, you didn't create the article, you didn't have years and years of experience to get it. But what I'm saving you is digging through and, and doing that work to come to that insights, right? Oh man, I cannot agree more with this. I think for anyone that's thinking about going into this, um, one video I watched early on that was like so valuable is um, Everything as a Remix. Have you seen that? Oh, no. I'll send so you the link later, man. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 like the premise is that, I mean, nothing ever is original, original. All music is sampled from something else. Writing, people are inspired by different writers. Like Anthony Bourdain and his writing was inspired by Hunter S. Thompson. Or, you know what I mean? Some of your favorite rap songs are sampled from 60s, whatever, classic jazz songs. So I think for me, I was like, oh, I don't have to be this great original thought every single time I write or create content. I just need to find a spin or, and it's the same thing, people follow you for your personality. Like being Australian, I'm not so serious. So sometimes I take the piss or um, I'm a bit more direct. So I think, I think, I hope people enjoy that. So like I wrote about um, Zilingo in Singapore and how they sort of collapsed and what a shit oh, show that was. I love, I love that one. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I didn't mind tearing it apart and saying, um, excuse my French, but like, what the fuck is this going like what is going on <laughs> exactly. it's like it's just crazy and yeah so that was my sort of spin whereas if you read like the straight times uh singapore times the straits times the straight times yeah yeah it's like it's pretty vanilla i don't know 
it's a it's a it's a street jacket if you like to call it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah like, i can't swear or say like man what the hell were these people doing correct yeah. correct correct i mean like uh, what you just said brought about uh my thought about have you watched the um wirecard documentary on uh, netflix so they came no. up so it was so the financial times obviously was the first one that uh, provided expose and everything but the documentary actually went behind the scenes of how they actually got the expose and all that and that was my god i i was i was standing at the edge of my seat because it was like obviously they dramatized the thing a little bit and 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 this guy had to like had to work in a isolated room no wi-fi signal they had to remove they had to modify the laptop so that it couldn't be hacked you know it's an app yeah. that's an air gap <laughs> It was an air gap laptop. It's like you know, NSA CIA, CIA level kind of kind oh of, kind of creepy. yeah. But go watch it. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It's like, how do you make it in a way palatable? Uh, because people love to hear stories. I mean, if you're gonna give a straight jacket like what we discussed earlier, it's it's like reading off the news. You know, it's like ugh, fact after fact. You know, people dumped after fact. Unless, unless people like us, we, we want to search that fact, but it's more to piece our story of how we looked at it, right? <laughs> Rather yeah, than, you know. Yes. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like, there always is a reason behind a fact. So if you read the Straits Times, Zillingo's collapsed, they raised this amount of money, then this amount of money, and then everything went to zero. Whereas, right. like, it's not that hard to say why this happened and then Correct. link everything together. Correct. Correct. I mean, FTX is another one. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, if you read, uh, uh, who's this guy I watch? There's this guy, he's, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's a famous YouTuber as well. Bolt, Bolt, Bolt guy, um, mm -hmm. finance guy. And he was like going into like in, in depth about why he behaved like that. He, his hypothesis of why he behaved like that, you know, mm -hmm. right. And then he grew arrogant, you know, uh, S SBF grew arrogant and then started doing this. And then he actually picked apart, um, the current CEO of uh, FTX, who was mm. the restructuring lawyer for Enron, and he says, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. "So it's like kind of ironic, right?" Yeah, and yeah, same thing. I don't know how much you've seen on Twitter, but people are getting pretty angry, and rightfully so, at yes. sort of the big media outlets like New York Times and stuff because they're just giving very vanilla, like soft takes. Yes, yes, because it, 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 and I, I understand. I'm, I empathize with them because the struggle is that they all. KPI is to churn out a story as fast as possible. Mm. And, you know, I produced like a video about a month ago, a month plus ago. And I said that if you're going to rely on news outlets, uh, as they okay, the KPIs are totally, it's not that they are not aligned with you. The KPIs are totally different. Mm. So the KPI is to churn out a story, uh, churn out something, uh, print as soon as possible. But you and I know that to understand a business, to understand an industry, to understand uh, a company, it takes time. You know, I only read, I like to read column pieces because it's like once a week, you know, it's well-researched, right? Rather than a headline news and just dum dum dum. they probably had, you know, uh, so pressed for time, get this out in 15 minutes, right? So it's just like pulling bits and pieces. Yeah. And you see that, it, just, it just goes, right? But then at the same time, you're relying, if you're relying on that as, a, as an investor to make investment decisions, then you miss so much nuance what goes on behind it you know so yeah that's yeah. something i'm still trying to figure out how to go i wish there was a google hack on how to filter by words you know what i mean like it has to be over <laughs> yeah. 1000 words to be 1000 yeah there's there's one i learned from a fellow investor uh, he um he actually had his 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 hypothesis and credit to him um his name is chang um he's actually he's actually you know a chat group Okay. One of our chat yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna point it out after the podcast. But what he did was this: his rule is, if there's more adjectives in a statement, it means a lot of a lot of adjectives like it conquers like 30, 40 percent of the article. Uh, you know, it's fluff. Fluff, yeah. It's it's fluff, right? So so the more adject adjectives you have in an article, it's it's fluff. <laughs> so he just kind of like ignores it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good rule. Good rule. <laughs> Yeah, good rule. Uh, I really like it. Right. Mm, since we're already within deep into this, how do you pick your topics, uh, Kalani? I know you've you've done one on the Singapore HDB. You've done one on the fire. Uh, then you've got people like Richard Lau, which is in you know private equity and all that. So, do you pick topics at random, or is there a certain rule base that you follow when you pick your topics? 
No, nah, it's pretty much as long as it covers Asia Pacific and does it interest me, I'll do it. But the problem is I have so many topics. I could bring it up on my phone. I have so many topics, but which one do I focus on and which ones are even just valuable to readers, but also like some topics just are too hard to research. They're too niche or uh -huh. I'm sure you have this problem sometimes as well. So. Yes, yes yeah. definitely. So can I, is it fair for me to say that sometimes it's opportunity, opportunistic as well in a sense that you, because you, you can't like, production is not linear, especially in our field, right? So mm. it's like, it's not this after this after this. Sometimes it's opportunity just presents itself, then you just rejig and everything. Is, is that, does that uh, occur to you as well? Sometimes, yeah. And I wish I did that more often, as in if a story is breaking, maybe not for FTX because it's more US based, but if there was a similar equivalent for TSMC or something, I should cover that because, yeah, sometimes it's what people want. But I don't want to be in the business of, um, creating content like yeah on a time schedule so mm. stressed out you know what i mean i do like sometimes that if i do the story of air asia and how they were founded it's not going to change now in three months when i finish mm. you know so not fair point i I'm, I'm like you um there are times when um um i look at content creators and and they go with the the topic of the day mm. uh yeah in the short term you may get the views you may get the 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 yeah the views but how sustainable or how, um, what do you call it, uh, evergreen that topic is going to be? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So and that's one thing I like in theory. It like, it sort of works, but at the same time, yeah, it, it sounds good in theory. Evergreen content, I'm like, yeah, I love it. But yeah. I don't know how successful it actually is for me. Correct, correct. Because it, it's always this balancing game as a content creator. You, you want your channel to grow. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, your audience is expecting fresh, con so-called fresh content. But at the same time, how do you anchor it to a, an evergreen principle? You may have a thematic topic, but then you anchor it to uh, a concept or a philosophy that is evergreen. I think that's where that's where people appreciate it. And it's so so funny. It, it just triggered um, me about watching an interview between Satya Nadella and Reid Hoffman. And you know what Satya Nadella actually said? He said, right. Huh? Every time I go into a business meeting and I meet people at Microsoft, I have to re reiterate myself over and over again. Just and and he said, it's, I hate it, but and I'm temp he's tempted to actually change the narration. But he said, no, just stick to it, right? All leaders are very tempted. Even leader, business leaders are tempted to change, right? Hit a little bit there, uh, tick off a little bit here, but it says, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> So the messaging has to be 100% every time. Yeah, yeah. consistent. So like, yeah, it was, it was pretty, yeah, I, it was uh, part of uh, Reid Hoffman's uh, interview series. And he does really good interviews as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I remember even you mentioned to me last time we interviewed about, so, yeah. yeah, sometimes you just got to repeat your same stories, principles, because someone new is finding it for the first time again. So it's yeah, like, exactly, exactly, exactly. What has been your experience getting guests on you know how many say yes how many say no and um yeah is it difficult to get guests especially when you're growing your channel uh i think i've been very lucky mm. um so i do a lot of cold emailing and even like there's a few refers but it's not crazy but like my stats are very like pulled out of my ass it's not exactly a science <laughs> but i'd say for every 10 emails i send and like obviously it's um there's a it's 80% template, 20% wow. um, curated That's to the my, person. Okay, and yeah. okay. uh, so for every 10 emails, I might get six responses. And then I'd probably say like four or three would actually book an interview. I think sometimes you go through stages. Sometimes I'll send 10 emails and I'll get like eight replies and book backs. And it's like, oh my God, there's too much on my plate now. And then other days you might send like 15, 20 and really only get two responses. So I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe it's, due to the timing of the year. Like I think maybe as head towards Christmas, more people have time off and um, saying yes might be a bit easier. Whereas if you're in January, February, people are a bit more hectic at work and it's a bit harder. But um, I think people like telling their story and talking about themselves. So I try and go with that angle as in, I want to share your lessons, stories and promote you and your work, which I think is deserved. And yeah, like I've enjoyed every episode I've done so far. I never reach out for the sake of reaching out or mm -hmm. take on someone I have to. So um, yeah, I'm always happy to take on the extra work when things do get hectic and 10 people will say yes at once. <laughs> that it's, 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 it's actually heartening because it's like 
we're, we're trying to edify these guys or the guests, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're also curious because you want to know what's behind what's written so far, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. um it's harder than what people think, but it's also easier at the same time, if that makes sense. Like, <laughs> yeah, it does. It definitely is. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, what's been your most interesting guest so far? I, I, I'm, I mean, mutual respect for all the guests that you yes. have, but probably pick up some that uh, you you've you've had got very vivid memory about. You know, uh, probably a take away from John of Asianometry or maybe Kala uh, for uh, God. Why did the name leave me? Uh, no, that's right. Uh, the lady in the US. Uh, oh, Carla Scanlon. Ah, yes, Carla Scanlon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I've got two. So. Okay. And they're both early episodes, and I feel bad because one of the audio is not that great. But John Buchanan, who used to coach the Australian cricket team, oh, I'm, cool. a, I'm a cricket nut. Like, I am such a cricket tragic. Mm -hmm. And I read his book as a kid, um, If Better Is Possible. I've got it right here as well. I can see it. Yeah. But, you got you, you, you to gotta forward the title, man. I, I love sports and coaches and, you know. Yeah, and it's what? more like a life book. So that's the book, If Better uh -huh. Is Possible. Um, okay. Massive influence on me as a kid. Just like in terms of constant improvement, like you can never stay the same. You're either getting better or getting worse. Mm. So getting him on the podcast was like, oh my God, this is like childhood dream. Except his audio wasn't the greatest, so it's a bit hard to listen to. So maybe just read the transcript. Okay. <laughs> and the other guest was um, Christopher Hood, who wrote the book um, Shinkansen and the Making of Modern Japan. Mm -hmm. So like my history was there. I'm not a big train nerd, but I like infrastructure. I find it cool enough. But I remember traveling through Japan on the Shinkansen reading that book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, this is just so interesting. All the statistics and how quickly it happened. And oh, I like fell in love with the book. And then that was like the first time, well, I suppose not the first, but being able to reach out to an author that I loved and to get a response back, I was like, oh my Lord, this is the coolest thing ever. Like there's not that much separation between you and your heroes. And that was one time where it's like, it's it's okay to meet your heroes. They don't let you down. So Chris was so nice. So <laughs> you were over the. Did you meet him physically or was it an online? Nah, so he's based in the UK, so it was a Zoom meeting. But just so kind, and he's so passionate and curious about the topic. Like he still teaches about the Shinkansen. I'm like, that was like so cool. But I feel oh. bad because it's not my biggest episode, like downloads wise. But for me, it's like that was like, oh my god, I love this job. This is so cool. You you pointed out something so so interesting. You, you remember we I, I shared with you some of the audacious requests by some of uh, my viewers, right? And I'm yeah. like, oh my God, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and I shared with you, and I think we both share this thing. We do this because we love the guest. Mm -hmm. We love wanting to hear the story and it doesn't really, at the same time, our audience think, oh, what's in it for me? What's the value I'm getting, right? But sometimes because it's so diverse, the audience guest is so diverse. I guess for us to stay, to stay sane and to do what we do, we, we really have to prioritize what we are curious about yeah like, i don't know whether that's something that you you hold true to yourself too um i've got a quote i think it's anthony bourdain but it's like this bus will make many stops and i make no guarantee that you will like it like <laughs> you'll enjoy all of them so <laughs> i love that's that. I'm gonna i go with that man <laughs> gotta borrow that yeah yeah yeah. So, yeah and like it, it's 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 for me like it's my podcast it's for my sanity and longevity i need yeah. to mix it up yeah. and like i'm completely upfront about that and even guess sometimes someone's like Oh, I don't know if I'm big enough or I'm like, man, it's my podcast. I can do whatever I want. If yeah. I find you interesting, I'll interview you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the funny part. A lot of the guys that I, I want to interview, uh, even when when I was with Firel and mm. we grew it to I would say an okay number, they come back and tell me like, no, I'm not interesting enough. And and here they are, they're like, you know, the pangolins of this world yeah. or the the Apollo of this world, right? And it's like they're like demigods and and yet they said oh i'm not interested you know i'm not interesting you know i mean <laughs> it's like i know it's it's a polite excuse for them not to come on i guess yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but there's two yeah, yeah there's two for me claire barnes i reached yeah. out and she gave me the nicest rejection i've ever had she was like oh i'm so happy for you in stoke but i think there's more interesting people in the world and uh, like better for younger generations i was like no you're kidding me like no, you're, you're kidding me right you're, you're, you're like a demigod i mean for me yeah. i'm like I, I haven't even seen her seen her physically right i want i want to meet her one day right definitely yeah, yeah so that was one and then there was one one thing that got me interested in business when i was a kid was the history show and probably my interest with asia specific asia pacific specifically uh -huh. is um it was a show called ausbiz asia so sarah clark the journalist she ran this show i think it was based out of hong kong interviewing okay. australian entrepreneurs doing business through asia and i was like oh my god this is what I want to do with my life. So like, mm. I, yeah, I was close to getting her on the podcast. Hopefully I might reach out again soon, but she was for me. I was like, Oh my God, please. Like my hero. Like, yeah. 
it's like the Christiana Anman, uh, Christian Aman Paul equivalent, I guess, for, for Asia Pac. Have you heard yeah. of uh, the CNN anchor? No. Yeah, she 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 literally wears military helmet to go into war conflict zones. Yeah, you, you, you could go. I don't know whether she Imagine. won a Pulitzer or something. Yeah, Christina Arman Pro. Yeah, a very 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 famous anchor from CNN as well. Oh, Interesting man. stories and all that. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's it's that's like the core of what I want to do on the podcast. Like it's such a niche thing. Osby's Asia. I don't think it had that many viewers. I remember coming home from Saturday hours after footy training and it was always on, so I'd watch it at one o'clock on a Saturday. It's just um, such a it's such a core memory and um, thing for me that I want to do it. But I think there is still lessons there because she would have interviewed dozens of dozens of entrepreneurs in Asia and learned how it works. So yeah, exactly. No, and nobody actually tells a lot of the stories unless they become big. You know, mm. they, literally, if Jack Ma didn't hit that trillion dollar or billion dollar kind of valuation, who would have known him, right? But exactly. At the same time, there's so many interesting niche stories. And uh, you know, like I was just, uh, you know. Uh, I was doing the co-hosting the uh, results briefing for Mega First, a Mega First Corporation. Um, I think we, I shared with you uh, my fascination for this company. But if you if you try to Google and find out about the founder's uh, history, you hardly find anything. He's so low yeah. profile, right? But he's he's a billionaire, right? And nobody knows about him. Nobody yeah. nobody tells a story about him, uh, unless you're a fund manager, and you're an analyst. You've 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 gotten returns for your for, for your investments nobody was heard of him and but this is what makes content creation in the finance space so interesting like like what you just described is like nail nail the coffin man <laughs> that's the only thing that scares me i'm like there is so many damn good stories out there how am i going to tell them all yeah, and yeah exactly. not overload myself and everyone else yeah exactly i mean i think both of us have so much fascination for john of asianometry right yes. and and the things it turns out like when he did that episode on Penang and the Silicon Valley, I'm like, my God, I'm ashamed as a Malaysian. I don't even know this, you know, right? <laughs> Here he is. I haven't figured out what nationality he's he's on. He's uh he's Taiwanese or American or uh like background background wise, don't know. I'm pretty sure he's American though. Living okay. in Taiwan now. Okay. Like, don't yeah. Care. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um what's the most interesting feedback you've gotten from guests? Damn, good question. <laughs> um, I've never really had anything negative, which is like good and bad. Sometimes mm -hmm. I wish someone would be like, hey, man, yeah, I don't know. It sucked one part of it. I think I think some people do like the process because I send the guests the questions, at least as a guide. So mm -hmm. some people feel a bit more prepared and how this is all going to work. I remember John even said like, it's probably been one of the easier podcasts because mm -hmm. everything's just sort of linked up. It's very easy, at least I think. And I'm always trying to make it as easy for guests as possible. Like I tell them the full spiel. It's only going to be an hour. It's not live. It's edited out. I'm trying to make it as comfortable as possible. And I think that really helps guests. Um, but feedback wise, Murray Hunter said I had a 6 PR voice, which is like an AM radio in Melbourne. Wow. So that was, was like an interesting one. Like, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I was like, sick PR voice. I was like, I've never heard anything like that before. So I've always, I'll always remember that one. So thanks to Murray for that. But yeah, okay. such a niche, niche bit of compliment feedback. So, Right. I interesting. Because, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, most of the time people try to be polite because you already featured them as a guest, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to see whether, you know, you've got something unique that you wanted yeah. to share. <laughs> nothing nothing okay. crazy yet. <laughs> nothing crazy. Um, Got to be uh, a little bit out of South Park question, but here's, here's uh, why I thought this, que this question was interesting. Similarities between fund managers or content creators or business owners and the differences. So I repeat the question again. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the similarities and what are the differences in between the different different guests that you bring on? Because some of them are managing funds, some of them are content creators like John, um, some of them just write newsletters for a living, uh, some of them are just authors. But what are the similarities and what are the differences that you notice among your guests? Very good question. Um, I, I was thinking about doing this for all my episodes, like trying to round up and curate all the lessons I've learned. So I really should have done this in preparation. Commonalities. <laughs> Um, there's two that they're both curious and willing to put themselves out there. I think, especially for me growing up, I've, I was very scared of what people thought and I don't know, it's a big, scary world, especially growing up with your parents, like, oh, the internet's a big, dangerous place. Be careful what you put out there. Whereas mm. like now I don't care. 
I don't know. I use Strava, so like all my runs and stuff. <laughs> you know, generally where I live. Yeah. So it's not as big and bad and scary as a thing. But they're all curious to learn more. Like I don't think you meet too many successful people that aren't curious how things work and are trying to understand why mm. things work. Mm. Um, and it's infectious. Like I like it, and so I bounce that off. Um, but differences. That's a mm. good one. Mm. I'm gonna have to think. Do you notice any differences? No. I mean, like uh, there's there's sporting guys, right? There's mm. there's also um, a lot of it content creators, you know, even Kyla Skylon, uh, who is like she she used to work in the hedge fund, right? Can't remember. Yeah, or at least capital markets or something like that. Yeah, yeah, at least capital markets, right? So just trying to like piece together what you observe. I mean, you've done like many many episodes, content creators and all that. I just wanted to see or, or compare notes with my own experience of you know interviewing guests on podcasts. Whether this, I find more similarities than differences, to be honest. Yeah. 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 One one difference, and I've always like I want to talk to someone about this, but especially coming from a sporting background, and it mm -hmm. kind of screwed me over when I started learning about investing. But investing, you can't have too big of an ego because then you get burned and killed. Like you can't pretend to know everything. Whereas in sport, if you don't think you're the best person ever and the greatest, you will get killed. Like yeah. you have to have supreme confidence playing sport. And as soon as I didn't, you just start to lose it a little bit. You know what I mean? You need to be an arrogant prick to I think become the best sportsman in the world whereas trying to transition to investing and juggle both of those that's so yeah. different for me the mentality yeah oh, that, that's a good one i mean like you see usain bolt whenever he starts i'm number one yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like and, and it even, even applies to like lower league people like yeah. if you're going to be i don't know the second worst player in the nba you still have to be arrogant because if you're not then you start like hesitating you're not as confident second and guess yourself you. yeah yeah. Whereas like you think, oh, I'll be humble and I'll acknowledge my weaknesses is going to make me a better basketball player. But it's like, nah, you really just got to be arrogant and think you're the best. And yeah, no, your place and role sometimes, obviously, but you really got to have like supreme confidence in yourself that you can do the job that you need Wonder to do. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Quick fire questions. Sponsored oh. content, yay or nay? Yay, to an extent. Okay. Um, what will your rules be? If you were to take on sponsorship, I mean, it's really something you got to believe in. And if everything blows up, you'd still back it in because it's like, yeah, I trust the people who use the product. But I mean, I don't think I have enough experience to be fully nay or yay. So it's a hesitant yay. <laughs> okay. All right. Next quick fire one managing funds or creating content? Creating content. So many less headaches, <laughs> especially stakeholder engagement. Yeah. So yeah. much less pressure. And I don't know. People don't shit on you as much for content. You still get shat on, but I think, I don't know, managers are tough life. I have so much respect for money managers. Like, <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Last one. Legacy for Q compounding curiosity. What do you want probably your children or grandchildren to remember compounding curiosity about? That's very good. I, I don't know. I'd love to people think I'm just curious, you know, I want to learn more. Um, just like, and not pigeonhole myself. Like I do focus a lot on business investing in Asia Pacific, but at the same time, I want to learn about trains. I want to learn about cricket, leadership, mm. sports. So yeah, I'm happy to go anywhere and everywhere. Like, so yeah, just a curious guy wanting to learn more and yeah, trying to get the best out of himself and others. Fantastic answer. I mean, how would you want compounding curiosity to grow? What, what trajectory or if, is, is it like still very fluid at this moment? very fluid and this is something i think about a lot is um i don't have sky high goals like i think let's say you started a podcast and you're like yep i'm gonna make this the best podcast of all time make money even if you fail i feel like if you fail it's probably a pretty good effort i have like very minimal goals like i want to earn some money on this podcast so i can pay an editor and uh like pay for all the stuff i don't want to do like i don't have very lofty goals i just want to enjoy it and do more of the stuff i enjoy so maybe if i fail it's like <laughs> A bit lower, you know? <laughs> so you don't disappoint yourself too much in a way. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I'm thinking like, maybe do I set loftier goals and be like the premier podcast within Asia? But mm. I think that comes with stress I'm not willing to live with. Mm. Maybe it can one. change over time. You never know. Yeah. So, and I think, I don't know. I talk about this a bit with mates. I think content is very all or nothing. So the longer I go, I might have nothing, nothing, nothing. And then one day I might just take off and then it's my full-time job. You know what I mean? Like it might mm. not be that sweet little transition where you're earning a few dollars a month and you know it'll yeah. just be yeah. yeah one sponsor makes it or breaks it great 
I'm going to do something like a Patrick O'Shea, but I'm not going to use the question that he's his standard question, which is the yeah. kindest thing that, you know, right. Um, if you were to meet one person physically that you think that you don't have access now, who would that person be? Uh, dead or alive? Uh, uh, either way, dead or alive. Dead, Don Bradman, like the guru. He played, uh, he's the best ever cricketer, like ever. And I was a okay. kid, I was just obsessed. So he's like, the Michael, he's like better than Michael Jordan compared to other basketball. You know what I mean? Like, okay, ah, oh, guru. Just, if anyone, legend, yeah. legend. Oh right? man, I've got so many books <laughs> in my bookshelf. Matt Don Bradman here. So, <laughs> um, alive. Off the top of my head, this is a big one. Like Yen Liao, I love his story. Like, especially being Australian, I can relate a bit more. I remember he had a quote about Women's Weekly, which is like this crappy little ma magazine that he found in the doctors, and he got some life advice out of it. And I thought that was the most hilarious thing ever. But, um. <laughs> He certainly won't. And he's had like a tough time, if I'm allowed to say it lately. Yeah. So I'd love to learn from that and pick his brain on that. Um, or Lilu, sorry. Lilu would also be a big one. Assuming Lilu can actually tell the truth and speak openly about his experience and what he thinks about like current events, you know, because yeah. I, mean? I think he's a bit handicapped into what That's he right. can actually. But yeah. Yeah. There, there's a filter already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe. Maybe maybe he's got a memoir hidden that will eventually come out hopefully one day. <laughs> his personal oh, journal, his personal oh. diary or journal that's hopefully, you know, posthumously post, uh, produced. <laughs> yeah, like legit. I would pay like a thousand, like I'd pay yeah, so yeah. much money to have access to that because I think it'd be so damn interesting getting an updated yeah. version of his book. Yeah, yeah, great. Where can people reach you, Kalani? Uh, the biggest one, probably uh, Combat and Curiosity. Obviously, okay. it's probably the podcast and even... Like allocatorsasia.substack.com is like my biggest vessel, I guess. I think that's okay. at like 1,600 email readers at the moment. So that's like those two operate in tandem because it's like, like YouTube and writing for Allocators Asia. Then my podcast is Compared and Curiosity. So Great. yeah, well, I'll leave links uh, in the show notes below. Um, it's uh, any last words from you um, to the audience, uh, to maybe budding content creators or probably uh, those guys that... Um, you want to be uh, uh, getting them as guests, maybe some words for them, you know. Uh, or for, or first I'll say thanks for having me on before I forget. But even most just welcome. like, for most people, just have a crack. Like, it's not as hard or as daunting as you think. Um, and there's so much to gain, like like meeting yourself. Like in Malaysia, is like honestly one of my travel highlights. And that all happened because I post content and get out there. And there's really nothing to lose. Like, just have a, have a dip. You'll be right. Yeah. Bob's your uncle. Bob's your uncle, man. And um, I think I do need to put in a plug for Aaron Pack, you know, yes. uh, for, you know, connecting both of us. And, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm interviewing Leo very soon. Uh, if you oh, know Leo. Yes. yes, yes. So he's he's eager to go. I'm eager to go. It's just that I told him I haven't gotten the equipment. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, so now, Yeah. And, and he introduced me to uh, Kristen. And uh, I'm going to feature about the food industry because mm -hmm. he's one of the largest uh, food food procurement companies in the world that buy uh, in Europe that actually mm. buys, you know, chicken, poultry and everything. So I'm very interested to understand that, that part of the industry. So uh, yeah, 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 I think yeah. Deep, that's what I want to do more myself as well. Deep dive type episodes, just because learning a market from scratch to decent enough is the funnest bit for me. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten a nuclear physicist as well as one of those. So we are, yeah, he's South African. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. South African uh, reached out to me um, and yeah, I'm, I'm like, looking so yes. forward to it man <laughs> yeah oh my god that's like silver platter yes <laughs> yes yes super platter. yes oh. it's been an absolute pleasure kalani um looking forward to seeing you produce more content um let's together galvanize the content creator economy uh, i think uh today we may not you, we may not see the fruits of our labor yet but you know hopefully one day with uh, what you've just said in to encourage new content creators to come on board it will, it will be heartening for them yeah, all good things take time. And again, like reach out to people. Like people are so much more contactable than what you think. Like, man, yeah. I'll respond. There's, there's, only, minutes, there's, only two, there's only two answers. It's a yes or no. If yeah. you say no, then just move on, right? <laughs> it's not that scary. And yeah. yeah, you never know what you might gain. It might be in something insane like jobs or just a friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you again. And uh, if you like this kind of episode, uh, like this kind of banter, uh, do subscribe to the channel, uh, give it a like, uh, share it with your friends and family. Let's all build uh, a better investing community rather than speculating. And, you know, I've heard so many sad stories about people losing their pants. And this is exactly why this show is for. Thank yeah. you again. Thanks, John. 
I appreciate it. Most welcome.